Monster Professor. Welcome to The Monster Professor, a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, myth, film, games, folklore, culture, and beyond. I'm your host, Josh Woods, author, editor, professor, and monster expert. And today's guest watches more horror films in a single year than I probably have in my entire life. And he takes that love for for monsters on screen, for horror films, and he turns them into some really amazing crafts. And he shows you how to do it as well. You might have already seen some of these on YouTube. I have with me Steve Ramsey from from the YouTube channel Woodworking for Mere Mortals and from the Weekend Woodworker online courses. He is far and away the internet's most famous woodworker. And so he just so happens to also love Halloween and the dark side of things. And so I get to pick his brain on these. Um, if you're at all interested in, in woodworking and these kinds of hobbies, you really have to check his stuff stuff out. He really focuses on woodworking for everyone. No experience necessary and most importantly, no huge woodworking shop and woodworking budget necessary. He'll set you up on all the essential tools you need for under a thousand. He can show you how to work with small spaces to no spaces. I mean, this guy was in an apartment in San Francisco dangling extension cords up to the roof where he was doing some of his woodworking projects early on because he just started as a hobbyist and he turned it into a one-man industry. He's a mogul now and I get to find out a little bit about that journey from him today and then we get to get into his real love secondarily if not his first and foremost love of monsters, of Halloween, of horror films. We get to find out from him what are some of the best horror films of all time, some of the best monsters on screen, what his thoughts are, maybe even some pragmatic advice when it comes to woodworking versus monsters. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I hope you do too. Here's my conversation with Steve Ramsey. It's my huge honor and pleasure to speak with Steve Ramsey. Steve, thank you so much for joining me on The Monster Professor. Hey, Josh, it's really exciting that you invited me to be on this podcast. This is the first non-woodworking podcast I've ever been on, and so naturally I jumped at a chance to talk about my second favorite topic, or maybe it's my first. I'm not really sure. <laughs> Well, yeah, most know you as perhaps the most famous woodworker on the internet, or maybe, the, yeah, I would say so. I was about to say maybe Nick Offerman is in the running, but the truth is you way out, you way out number him in, uh, at least in YouTube. Uh, you're, you're sitting on what, 1.4 million subscribers, I think yeah, it is. Somewhere around it, somewhere around in there, yeah. And I think your top viewed episode is like 26 million views. Like all it's sorts of crazy. I know. Like all sorts of YouTubers would sell their souls to get those kinds of numbers. <laughs> and oh, I would too. Nobody, nobody can predict when a video is going to be like that, though. You know, you get those viral videos and it's like, oh, yeah. how, how did that one become viral? I don't know. But you didn't sell your soul, and I think that's something we're going to get into in a little bit, uh, because it didn't take me long as as a fan of your woodworking show, and I learned so much from so many of your episodes, but it didn't take me long to realize, oh my God, this Steve Ramsey guy is seriously into horror and monsters <laughs> and scary stuff and scary films, and you made some of your own episodes actually quite disturbing and creepy as well. <laughs> Oh, I love to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's what, when I started realizing that, I'm like, oh man, I really want to talk to him on this show. Um, and so it's a great pleasure to get to do so. I figured, I figured we'll start out a little bit by, by letting everybody know how you got to this point, uh, before we start getting into these uh, monsters and horror films. So. Um, as far as I can tell, about 12 years ago, in a humble chessboard project as a hobbyist, and then 
That's exactly <laughs> where it started from. It, it was uh, 2008, and YouTube it was pretty new at that point. And uh, I was had already been watching YouTube for a while, and I was also a woodworker. This, of course, wasn't my full time job at that point, but I was. I decided I wanted to build this chess board, and I thought, you know, this would be a good opportunity to just document what I'm doing, and then post it on YouTube and just kind of for fun, really. So it was like seven really long, boring parts because back then YouTube had a 10-minute time limit on video. So oh, yeah. I had to break <laughs> up this really long video. And it, was, uh, it was so boring. But people started watching that, and it was uh, it was pretty cool, you know, to see comments on something from people I didn't know. And so eventually I started to really identify what it was people were enjoying about my videos and kind of lean into that and uh, explore the idea of making projects with kind of a rudimentary basic level of power tools that anybody could get for their own garage or basement or whatever. And so that was where I formed Woodworking for Mere Mortals a few years later. And, you know, the channel just sort of grew from that point. It was kind of funny because back then there were very few people who were making a living on YouTube. It was it was still just an amateur platform, but as more and more people started watching my channel and I started spending more time on that, I was able to devote less time to my actual job as a graphic designer. So eventually I just kind of transitioned to making YouTube videos full time. And so that's what I've been doing ever since for, yeah, like you say, about 12 years now. Man, and so was, was there anything did, did that you think flipped the switch to turn it from just a hobbyist YouTubing thing into a sensation? Like a, you're a one man industry I think, at this point. How <laughs> well, did that I think happen? That there's, there's a, you know, it, it was a very gradual kind of organic process for me. Today, a lot of people, you know, start YouTube channels with the idea of, well, this is exactly what I want. You know, they've got a whole business plan and everything in order and <laughs> and kind of really hyper-focused. Whereas me, I just kind of let it grow organically, just did what I was doing naturally. I had no intention of this being a full-time gig, but it was only when I discovered that I was earning, you know, more money or I had the potential of earning more money on YouTube than I could with my graphic design business. And at that time in 2008, my de design business was already feeling the effects of the recession. And so a lot of my longtime clients were no longer in business and I was losing clients. So it was really natural for me to start to spend more time on something else. Yeah. And I, and I think, um, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, first attracted me just as a hobbyist viewer, like I, I would be embarrassed to show anybody my own woodworking projects as fun as they are. I'm an extreme amateur on that kind of thing. And so, but I was still intrigued by your videos. And I think one of the main reasons is that you're such a good teacher. Like I, I have a short tolerance for bad teachers and an extreme appreciation for good ones. And man, oh man, like it's seems like woodworking seems like one of those things that you wouldn't be able to teach so well online but you figured it out and and I work <laughs> at a I work at a college where you know we have we have woodworking uh, or, or carpentry certificates and even degrees and, and a lot of well uh, carpentry welding a lot of hands-on projects and and they're hit like a lot of us in the country right now, at least in education, go on purely online. And I thought, man, how how difficult must it be for for them? And then I thought, well, Steve Ramsey's figured it out. <laughs> and so, so any any advice for those, uh, th you know, looking at taking a hands-on type of thing like what you do and and making it really effective uh, through the medium of just online. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, woodworking is kind of a good example of that. When I started in, you know, back in 2008, it, there was like two other people who were making woodworking videos, and now there's probably over a thousand yeah. people doing that. But the the advice I would have for anybody starting any YouTube channel is to have it really focused on your audience, understand what it is you're trying to say. There's a lot of people making really good woodworking videos, but they don't really 
uh, it's not clear what their focus is when people go to that channel. When people go to my channel, they know instantly, oh, this is a channel for beginners. In fact, it even says right on the channel, this is like woodworking for beginners, people with no experience necessary. So when I make videos, I'm always thinking about what would I need to show, what would I need to know if I was brand new looking at this and think about that person and then make my videos and every procedure of that focus towards that person. I'm not interested in a person who has a big $100,000 workshop. They're not my audience at all. So I just know my audience really well and that's where I point all of my attention towards yeah, uh, yeah, and that and that title, "Woodworking for Mere Mortals," is so great because uh, yeah, I guess I myself feel like a mere mortal when I'm out there trying to <laughs> trying for the fifth time to to cut a board in a in a somewhat straight manner <laughs> and trying to figure out what wood glue is for. <laughs> yeah, I came up with that title actually. It was kind of funny because I didn't. I didn't know what to call what I was doing, and I didn't want to just have woodworking for beginners or something like that. But I was, I had like kind of grown up on the only place where you would see any woodworking was on TV, and then it was on like really boring PBS shows or some of the <laughs> DIY shows. And but these guys all had these, you know, huge, you know, laser guided saws and all this, all this equipment. And I thought, wow, you know, most people don't have all of that stuff. And really, what I want to do is make a show that's accessible by anybody. And so that's when I just kind of, well, we're just mere mortals here working on this stuff. And and uh, when you get into a lot of your projects, it doesn't take long before you see some really cool ones, especially coming out around the time of October every year. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and but, so some of your some of your Halloween projects or some of your horror related projects, man, they're mm-hmm. so cool. You've got you've got like functional pieces like a coffin and like the medieval yeah. stocks. <laughs> and then you've got some awesome like you know wall hanging. pieces. Pieces like a demonic door wreath or like the Rocky Horror Picture Show lips kind yeah. of thing. Um, a, re- a really cool Jason's machete that you it eventually incorporated to this really cool frame for a, for a Fangoria magazine. But I think the the one that I want to ask you about the most <laughs> is this Ouija board <laughs> that you did. <laughs> Because <laughs> first of all, it was it was absolutely gorgeous, and the and the pyrography, the the wood burning you did on it was was gorgeous too. But um, as far as I can tell, you lost a lot of viewers on that one. Like that <laughs> freaked a, people out. What was up with the what was up with the Ouija board episode? Oh, it was a channel killer there. That was <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, so basically, all of my Halloween videos perform really poorly on the channel. It's just kind of such a specialized thing. So it's like. Once a year, I get a chance to really make video that I just really is self-indulgent and something that I'm really, you know, passionate about. And that has to do with anything with monsters and horror and, you know, anything like that is what I really want to lean into. And, of course, I kind of get that opportunity in, in October. So a lot of them aren't for everybody, but I try to make them all fun or funny at least to somewhat. But the Ouija board, wow, I didn't realize the kind of, I sort of did realize some of the reaction I would get to that. Because a lot of people are really superstitious and they really have these strong beliefs about, you know, that this is like a demonic item. And so, <laughs> so like, I made this Ouija board and I just think it's the coolest thing ever. I think it just looked cool with a little planchette and everything. It was just awesome. And yeah, I, I definitely had some people like, well, I, I'm out of here. Unsubscribe. Never watching <laughs> your videos again. I'm like, well, I don't believe this is real. Do you really believe this is going to, but you know, so I don't believe in anything supernatural, but I love the whole aesthetic of it. But so once people, you know, I had a number of kind of complaints about the, the project and that video. Then for the next month or so, I, <laughs> I made a point of having that Ouija board in the background of my regular videos. And, <laughs> and so it was just like sitting back there. And then people would start to comment. Everyone, and I still get these comments on those, those videos that people are watching. They're like, What's with the Ouija board? What are, what are you? What are you trying to do? And so then at one point, I ha- made a video where 
throughout the video, I would just turn the Ouija board in a different <laughs> direction. And this is just in the background. So you really can't see much of it. But if you're close, pay close attention, you'll see it move. And then some people would ask me about that. And my response, you know, in those comments is always like, what? I don't see anything moving. Are you seeing something? I'm not seeing. <laughs> so I'm just like, I've become like such an internet troll with that Ouija board. <laughs> Uh, actually, I found myself doing the same thing on, on campus. I, I In my office, I have a Ouija board up there just to freak people out, I think. <laughs> like, there are much more freak, there are much freakier things in my office, like a, like a hand, uh, like a homemade velvet painting of Hulk Hogan that I found in the trash in Kentucky somewhere. Like, that's gigantic. But when they walk in and they see the Ouija board, a lot of students get freaked out. I'm like, it's yeah, Milton it's, Bradley. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is a toy. I mean, it was, it's really, it was kind of made famous by, I think, the Exorcist really kind of yeah. did, the, did the thing in there. But it's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's funny. I even mentioned that on this last year's Halloween video. I, I mentioned the previous year's video, which was the Ouija board video. And I'm like, wow, people really, you know, I got more comments on the Ouija board video than any other Halloween video, including like Jason's machete, which, you know, in the movie was literally designed in those movies to just hack away and murder people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, any complaints about that? No. <laughs> You've even done bored. videos where you like fake uh, chop off your own limbs, and they're not oh, no. as freaked out as about about that as they are the Ouija board. I don't know, but I mean that's that's another thing that's so enjoyable. I mean that's what I mean that about the the lack of soul selling as as coincidental as as it is with the Ouija board. <laughs> but you're still doing what you love rather than pandering to a to a specific yeah. type of audience. So, and I got to say, you know, those are the small minority of people who were you know kind of upset or freaked out over that uh, that video. Most of the people really enjoyed it. And most of the people by now, after this many years of doing this on Halloween and thereabouts, understand that I'm going to be doing these kind of videos. And, you know, if, if they don't, if they're not into that, then just don't watch. And I think that it accounts for the numbers going down on those videos. They don't get very many views on the Halloween videos, which is kind of for me, it's kind of a bummer because those are my favorite videos to make. And I have a lot of fun making those and they're not intended as, you know, do it yourself videos, your how to videos, instructional videos, even though they're sort of framed around that. It's really just, it's a chance for me to have fun and make something at least sort of cinematic, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And even the, I mean, you're saying they don't, I think even in one of your videos, like no one's going to watch this one anyway. I'm just going to do what I like. And you still got like 45,000 views or something. Right. So that's still, that's, that's nothing to sneeze at. Um, let's, and I know you, and I know you're a massive movie buff on top of this. Like, yeah. and I find out how many movies you watch. Like I don't, I, I thought I watch a lot, but I don't come close to keeping up with them like you do. So <laughs> I, I, oh, figured, yeah, I watch hundreds every year. I watch hundreds of movies. Yeah. God, maybe let's just jump in. Let's just jump into some monsters and some movies and horror movies and stuff. What's Maybe I should just maybe I should just hit you with a simple and extremely mean because it's so difficult kind of question. However simple it is, you've watched hundreds and hundreds of horror films. You love the dark side and the monsters. Where would you go if I if I put you on the spot and made you pick your your pick for the best monster on the silver screen, like the best monster out of Ooh. movies? Best monsters. Well, I guess that's, hmm. yeah, that's one of those questions. Like, you know, I'm on woodworking podcasts sometimes and people ask me what my favorite tool is. And I'm like, well, it depends. <laughs> but I think if I had to pick favorite monster, it kind of, there would be a couple different categories. Like sort of my go-to answer would fall in line with what I think is probably my favorite horror movie of all time, which would be the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So I would kind of think as a monster, I would say Leatherface is pretty pretty damn cool and it's also i like kind of all the you know iterations of Leatherface, where he goes kind of through this like transvestite phase and you know <laughs> the next generation and all these different but the original leather face i think is is pretty pretty cool if i had to pick like a specific monster and this is going to be very specific is lucio fulci's zombie oh movie. man 
Yeah. And it's it's the zombie with with the worms coming out of his eye, and that one it was on the cover of Fangoria magazine way 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 back, and I remember watching that and just thinking this is the creepiest thing ever. I just loved loved that monster. It was it was amazing. But I have to say, you know, I think that, uh, and this actually is what probably got me into horror movies was goes back to when I was probably around. I don't know, seven or eight years old. And I was in um, Springfield, Illinois. I was staying with my uncle and my aunt and uncle. And my uncle had this really cool, like, like shed. It was more than a shed. It was like a separate little house, but it was his thing. In fact, today they would call it like a man cave, I guess. But he would show, he had movie projector in there. It was really cool. This was back oh. in, the seven, in the 70s. And so he would show eight millimeter and 16 millimeter films but he had this collection of monster movies and he had uh but the one he showed me and i i remember this so vividly <laughs> this is gonna sound really dumb but it was abbott and costello meet frankenstein <laughs> okay, so this was and for anybody who's much younger than i am they may not know abbott and costello it was a comedy duo back in the 1950s and so they they did this series of monster movies with universal monsters and uh i don't know if they did a series maybe they did a series but i know they had the, uh abbott and costello meet frankenstein but there was one scene in that and it was the uh like a casket was opening and it had boris karloff playing the monster and it had that hand just his hand coming up out of this this box and i don't know why i remember that so well but i was so fascinated with that i thought this is so creepy and then as a kid i got really into frankenstein's monster and all of those things i got this book it's like one of these scholastic books you get when you're a kid like how to make your do your own monster makeup and i remember doing frankenstein's monster for halloween where i made my own using like a paper bag for the head you know and painting it and all. <laughs> it looked really dumb but at the time that was definitely he was my favorite monster but now looking back on it it's like well, i don't know if that's any of those monsters are all that scary anymore. <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, Abbott and, Abbott and Costello me Frank, is, that one still holds up, actually. Uh, it's still <laughs> enjoyable to watch. Years. <laughs> um, what, what, what was Halloween like as a kid in the 70s? Or what was Steve Ramsey's Halloween like? <laughs> well, it was pretty much the uh, same as most kids back then. It was just finding a cool costume, going out with a bunch of friends, and spending a, a, I think the one thing that's changed from today is I know we took our son out trick-or-treating and he's you know 22 now but when he was little we would take him out and it was much more of a, a kind of an orchestrated event where families would go out with their kids and there was like certain neighborhoods near I, where I live where you know they're like Halloween neighborhoods people just really go all out for Halloween and but when I was a kid it was just like you know four or five of us would get together and we're like okay we got to go bike and we would just leave and yeah. <laughs> just go roam the neighborhood and we'd be gone for hours in fact i remember a couple times filling up a bag of candy and having to bring it home dump it out and go out for more <laughs> Yeah, I think I think I might have been one of the last generations to be like a free range Halloween kid. So like, <laughs> like when I I had some of my younger students asking uh, after I watching a Stranger Things episode, like, was is that what Halloween was like in the eighties? Where all the adults just said, "You just go out in the dark, kids, and in <laughs> in costumes, and just do whatever." I'm like, yeah, it was. It really was. It's not like it that was. anymore. I feel and like the magic all... is lost. I don't know. It, but there was still all of the all of the rumors and legends that went around it you know oh, there, yeah. there, there'd be razor blades or tainted candy or something and that was kind of part of the thrill of it i guess thinking that even halloween 2 actually alludes to that where they yeah. had the very beginning the, the razor blade he's bitten into it in, the, in the apple but i think even then like we knew that well this wasn't really true it was just like stories <laughs> you know it's like nobody we knew would do that yeah, but man, they 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 freaked me out so much. Like I, I thought, and and but it wouldn't stop me. I don't know. Was was there a monster that scared you as a kid in particular? I think that the uh, for some reason I remember going through a period where vampires really freaked me out, and I remember uh, also going back to the old Universal monsters, Bela Lugosi's Dracula. 
uh, just the whole tone of that movie and the, the way he carried himself. Uh, yeah, totally, totally freaked me out a lot. I also remember seeing, um, Creature from the Black Lagoon and I, today I love looking at that huge rubber suit and how kind of cool the whole aesthetic is. But at the time that, I don't know, is it something about that also just captivated me? <laughs> Yeah, the man that original Bella Lugosi Dracula. I don't, I don't know. It's just become so iconic. I don't know if enough people appreciate how beautiful and masterful that film is. I mean, that really holds up well too, and oh, the performances yeah. are amazing in that. It is, and it's. I think even today, it's almost weirder because it's it's kind of it was right at the beginning of talkies so the sound quality was really bizarre and awkward and it just today it just kind of works it's like almost it they intentionally made it clunky or something but you know they didn't they just the way it was yeah and like and uh like a uh, bella lugosi and uh white zombie too and i know you even did a project on uh you like created the sculpture of the castle yeah. in white zombie right right Man, yeah, that, but, but I jumped way past your original answers because I gotta mention, like, uh, Fulci Zombie, that movie, that freaked me out so much. Just that, that image that you're talking about with the worms yeah. on the head. I mean, <laughs> you watch that movie and you, and you, only then do you realize, wow, I, this guy actually visually understands a zombie. All the other zombies, as cool as they were in other films, don't really make you feel like this thing is a dead body out of the ground. But that movie yeah, does. I think it's kind of funny because a lot of people, I don't know if they still kind of considered that, but at the time it was kind of considered, considering, it was considered kind of a ripoff of George Romero's Day, Dawn of the Dead. And that he was just kind of cashing in on that. But it's really a totally different movie. And in some ways it's, it goes, it predates Dawn of the Dead because it has kind of more of like the voodoo type zombies rather than the plague zombies. Oh, it's a, it's an odd mix. I love the, the zombie in that who attacks the shark. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> my oh my God. Moment. I forgot there was a zombie versus shark scene. <laughs> oh my God. I keep forgetting yeah. that. And every time I rewatch it, I'm just like, this is the greatest film of all time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, Lucio Fulci had some really good movies at Gates of Hell. I really liked that one a lot. And some of his others oh man it just the cup i remember i have a stark memory as just a kid walking into a video rental store these were for our younger listeners these were stores in which you had <laughs> to rent movies and bring them home to watch them uh physically and i saw the cover box of zombie and i had nightmares for weeks just glancing at the cover box. <laughs> oh, totally <laughs> yeah you know those that's vhs Cover art was, that was everything. I mean, oh my gosh, there are so many movies who, who really made their mark in the VHS market. And I'm sure Zombie was one of those because, you know, that and maybe like Maniac. And there's some really, those really memorable covers that just, ah, they just so enticed you to want to see that movie. Yeah, it was a big part. Of, it was a big part of the project is getting the poster right, getting that cover for the movie right. Yeah. And, um, and man, and, and about Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like the first time I saw that, that bone room where we take that really slow look around all those bones in that room. Oh man, that like that's, that's a, that's a special room in my nightmare world for me. And Texas Chainsaw oh, Massacre is amazing. It totally is. And that, I, that scene is probably one of the best scenes in the movie really because it kind of gives you also a glimpse into Leatherface because he's he's kind of confused about everything that's going on in there and you almost get like this glimpse into a guy that's just not all there and almost almost see into the actual person there. I think that's what disturbs me the most about Leatherface. Yeah, that like that sunset scene you get when he's swinging the chainsaw around yeah. toward the end. You can't really tell. I can't really tell anyway whether it's like it's like I, just a rage filled. I want to kill you, <laughs> or if it's like a King Kong, like oh my love has left me kind of thing. Like I, I can't tell what he's feeling there. It's a, he's a stra he's a strange mystery. Leatherface is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I actually, I, and I love the remake too. I think the remake is really good. As much as I love the original, man, that remake is a good film. God, I don't think I've seen the remake actually. Oh, I'm yeah, gonna check this out. 
Um, I just to corner you on one movie because I haven't really got to talk with many people about this one, but it's it's one of my favorite of the 21st century, I think, and I think it's just absolutely amazing. It, it might be up there with my top ten horror films of all time, but Robert Eggers made a movie called The Witch uh, oh, a God. few years back, and I've <laughs> seen you with a T-shirt of it before in one of your videos. Is one reason I bring it up to you. <laughs> What are your thoughts on The Witch? Yeah, okay. I would place The Witch as one of the greatest horror movies ever made. It's definitely in my top five. Uh, it could pretty much be close to one or two. I, I love that movie so much. I think that was – The Witch kind of ushered in this whole kind of a new era that we're in in horror right now of a much more, you know, thoughtful horror films, more paced. You know, I, I don't – really want to use the term slow burn because it's kind of thrown around but it it was kind of a slow burn and i just i loved everything about that maybe it's just because i'm getting older i i really appreciate these movies that just try to reach me at a real visceral level and that was one of those movies that just just blew me away and i i've seen it several times since then and i just i love it every every time that's that's hard hard hitting movie i think yeah it's i think and and I get, I guess I get some of the, some of the hate for it that came out, but because you've got to, you have to be the ideal viewer to really get the most out of it. I mean, I even have to, I have to turn the subtitles on because <laughs> I can't really pick up on what they're saying. Their accents are so thick, even though they're speaking English technically. But then once you have the subtitles on, you can see how beautiful the language is. And it's pulled, a lot of it's pulled directly from journals and, and witch hunting uh, accounts or which accounts from the era it's just so gorgeous oh absolutely and and this is we're just in a, a, this new era with these young filmmakers him and uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank who made Hereditary and Midsommar uh, oh, yeah. yeah. and oh my gosh both of those guys are really kind of carving out a, a new path for horror and, and even Robert Eggers, Robert Eggers' follow-up, uh, The Lighthouse, you know, if it's like, uh, is it a horror movie? Is it not a horror movie? I don't care because it's just so cool and so weird, and I love that. Yeah, that I mean, that was an amazing, that was an amazing thing too. It was a, uh, a beautifully horrifying or disturbing vision of a of a mermaid uh, <laughs> as well. <laughs> Oh man, that that one. I guess I, I guess I have a little bit more love for the. I'm biased towards witches, and I had to write a whole novel about them just because there wasn't enough witch stuff for me to consume. I guess. So, <laughs> yeah. so I so I'm big into the witches, but man, the the I don't know. You, the, oh, sorry. Have, have you seen Hagazusa? No. It's the German film uh, about a witch, and I would highly recommend that one. It's on Shudder right now, and uh, that's another film that also has that really slow, deliberate pacing, and I, I think that one's really good. It's very reminiscent of The Witch. Oh, I've got to check that out. Thanks for that lead, man. Because, the, yeah, The Witch, I just... It, it, very quickly, I realized I'm not safe in this film. Like anything right. can happen, and I don't get to just go, "Oh, the character is just hallucinating or is going crazy." Like, no, this is all uh, anything could be happening in the next scene, and I'm not safe. But that's what that's that tough balance. Like in the lighthouse, as soon as you introduce kind of madness or hallucination, I think it kind of makes it a bit safer, and that's just a tough balance i think the shine i think kubrick's the shining balanced that out really well you can have both like it's for real and you have madness but right you know. so so what would so what would some of your best horror films be of all time then since you've got you've got a catalog of hundreds in your mind <laughs> and and the witch would be up there maybe a, a few other favorites that you might pick out um i mentioned the Her hereditary definitely i love hereditary and that's just a couple of years ago that one came out um let's see let the right one in uh, I don't know if you've seen that, the vampire movie from, I guess it's Sweden? No. I Taking don't know Dead. this one. Let the right one yeah. in. 
Let the Right One In. Uh, really, really love that movie a lot. I really liked uh, Paranormal Activity in all of those movies. I think that those had a really cool, creepy vibe to them. And I love the, I also love movies like that that are just made for nothing and then just blow up. And I think that one hits all the, oh, I know a movie that I think is super creepy it is Wreck, the Spanish uh, I guess kind of a rage zombie type movie. Uh, it's a also um, found footage kind of film. Uh, have you seen Wreck? No, I haven't. I get, I'm, would, I'm making a big list here. <laughs> Wreck is one of my oh Saw. I like all the the whole Saw series yeah. is is one of my one of the things I'd love to make is one of those reverse bear trap jaw <laughs> things from Saw. <laughs> I think that would be uh, that would be really awesome. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot. Oh, Tucker and Dale versus evil. That's a really funny one. one of my favorite. That, that shouldn't be as good as it was, but <laughs> so many of those, so many of those kind of spoof horror movies that end up becoming the real horror movies. They're spoofing like a uh, Leslie Vernon behind the mask yeah, as well. Right. Like they're, they're, they shouldn't be as good as they are, but they're fantastic <laughs> films. Um, yeah, you know, the, I'm, as much as I am into monsters uh, and as much as monsters dominate, uh, so much of my <laughs> reading and my thinking and my writing and my viewing, um, I, I really don't end up getting into kind of the, the slasher, the, the, I don't know, the slasher chopper or saw right. kind of things. And I, and I know that, you know, when people talk about the horror genre, that's for a lot of people, that's the first thing that come to mind and that, and you're deep into that. And I'm, and I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are on the, uh, on the appeal of the films in which the horror has a lot to do with getting body parts chopped up. And, and I wonder if there's any connection to, to deep fears as a woodworker. <laughs> <We get it. laughs> Oh, well, that's an interesting. <laughs> Don't lose my fingers. Um, no, I when first you know, I, also I don't think that uh, the slasher is my favorite genre of horror these days. I think at one time I was really much more into that, into the Jason and Michael Myers and all of that. And even though I've done a lot of you know Jason projects and and those kind of. Um, woodworking related things it's just because there's things that are associated with those you know I mean there's actual you know, machete that I, I can make but I think that uh, I think people got attracted to those because it was one step closer to reality than Godzilla or King Kong that those are kind of a little bit more removed but when you can kind of imagine that it's an actual person you know, doing the killing. I mean, this probably goes back to Psycho, probably before Psycho even, you know, it was just like that's kind of a scarier, um, a scarier thought. And I, I know that I also have gone through, a, I still am really into zombies too, as far as, you know, just flat out monsters, <laughs> even though that's kind of, I think that ship is starting to sail <laughs> for the zombie movies. But I've always liked all of the Romero's and I like his movies and I like the, just the concept of this whole, you know, it's you against practically the entire world and trying to trying to take them on. But yeah, maybe I maybe I am a little bit afraid of losing a finger on my table. So. <laughs> yeah, what, and so where do you think? I mean, that makes that makes a lot of sense, I think. But where do you where do you think your your drive toward the dark side came from? Like why or why yeah. why horror? What took you in that direction and, and made you fascinated with these kinds of things? I have I, that's a question I've thought a lot about myself and I just I don't think I have a good answer. I think that there's parts of it that um it's a lot of different things that combine. I think when I was when I was when I was a kid, they scared me and I liked that feeling of it's a it's the roller coaster scare, you know, it's scary even though you know it's a hundred percent safe. And so I think that was a lot of it. And then as I started getting older and, you know, I started reading horror magazines and I got really into the special effects. And then I was like really curious about how the actual movie and the monsters themselves were created. And 
that kind of occupied a lot of my time. And I would find myself watching movies to see who did the special effects and how they were made and um, being more attracted to that. And then as I get older, I'm still interested in special effects, but movies, there's, I guess I'm just so desensitized. <laughs> there's really, movies don't really scare me anymore. But, <clears throat> and I think this is why I'm more into these more deliberate films now is because what really can disturb me is a well-told story that kind of gets under my skin with characters that I can believe in and follow. That's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a clear, that's a clear line of kind of, of progress. You, you start off with this kind of sensory vis, visceral attraction and then get fascinated with the craft and then finally the true art of it. Was, is that kind of how your, your woodworking life has gone? Today? Yeah, it, it kind of is. And I guess it's, um, you know, and a lot of what the horror, a lot of what I like about horror too is just the visuals of it. And so it really kind of, it makes sense through my entire career going from uh, a photographer to being a graphic designer to making woodworking projects to shooting video. These are all visually related kind of creative endeavors. And so anything that has this visual appeal and aesthetic to it, I'm really drawn towards. Yeah. And you've, and uh, you've kind of turned that into some, some serious uh, visual art as well. Like even just, I'm just thinking back on, one of my favorite episodes that uh that Ouija board project that you were doing like there are moments in there that are genuinely disturbing when you're sanding the Ouija <laughs> board in the dark and there's like these figures moving in the background that are kind of like Jacob's ladder types of thing like you can't quite see what they are and it makes it that much scarier and you're just, you're just sanding in silence except for the scrape of the sandpaper over the wood <laughs> and then you look up from the dark for the longest time and then i'm like oh shit what's gonna happen what's <laughs> what's what's happening and then you go back to sanding i'm like oh man that was that was legitimately creepy <laughs> wasn't oh, I'm, so for glad that. To hear, I'm so glad to hear that you say that because that's really i love doing that and i think i i guess it's just because i have seen just hundreds thousands of horror films and i know kind of what they should look like and i kind of understand this you know base level of tension and and how to create that i don't know if i really have all of the tools to do that properly but in my shop with the camera i have i try to recreate that in my halloween videos but at the same time i have to recognize okay there's got to be kind of a funnier element to this as it goes on <laughs> otherwise it just is like oh this is depressing but yeah i love doing that i love kind of creating those scary moments especially on a channel that is a DIY woodworking channel, you know, it's like, <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense, but I, I just have so much fun and so much fun kind of crafting those videos. It's really a blast. I, I mean, secretly, I would just do that all the time, you know, if I could. <laughs> well, I've got a huge request for you then. I want you to make your own indie horror film, like The Woodworker or something, and just go all in <laughs> and make it a short one even. No, it's like a 60-minute horror film and, and put all your all your experience into it because I, I think you could seriously do it. I could expand. I made one a while back. This is, man, this is probably seven, eight years ago. I did this uh, woodworking for mere zombies, and so <laughs> it was this, this kind of the subtitle of it was: "It's an all new brainless DIY show for your undead lifestyle." So I was really what I wanted to do was just kind of poke fun at the, these HGTV and these DIY channel shows where they show you how to make really these kind of dumb projects but i thought well if it's what if you were a zombie and you were trying to do this woodworking show well naturally you're going to end up cutting your fingers off and you're going to do all this really so he ended up like you know painting the project with blood and things <laughs> but that was like that was kind of the first one that people like just did not 
like because it was just kind of gross and i did i just loved i loved that whole thing like peeling the skin off my face it was, it was a lot of fun yeah and you've and you've even got to meet the master of that didn't you get to meet tom savini the master of this i did and that's why i made that um a frame for it because i i've been a subscriber to fangoria since like day one basically my, my whole life and so i had uh him sign an issue which was from uh, Friday the 13th, the final chapter, which is he often kind of cites that as one of his favorites movies that he worked on. And so that was, that was really cool to meet him, get a picture with him and then have him sign that. So I made the frame for it. And then I took, I made two Jason machetes and I put one of them in that frame. So it looks like the, the machete is slashing into the frame and then there's blood dripping out of the bottom of it. But those machetes I made, I made those out of maple, which is a really hard wood. And I actually, you know, honed it down to that. They're actually really sharp <laughs> machetes. It's surprisingly, it's surprising how kind of deadly a piece of wood could actually be if it's sharpened down like that. Yeah, you could have one in a in a vampire slaying kit. I think you could. <laughs> well, actually, we've I've had I've had other folks on here before those those who are uh, ser- you know, serious occultists and magicians or martial arts experts, and and we can't we can't seem to come to a consensus on whether or not you could actually drive a wooden stake through the human rib cage. And as a woodworking expert, maybe you would know the answer better than anybody. Could we get a wooden stake in through the rib cage into the heart? Do you think? Oh, and what, absolutely. <laughs> what wood would you What wood would you recommend for that? And and how, well, how the dimensions would you say are ideal? <laughs> I would go with. I would definitely go with maple. Maple is like one of the hardest, you know, kind of commonly available woods you can get. And I would I would turn it so that it was it was round all the way around. I think a lot of the stakes that you see sometimes are more like. I don't know, like stakes that you pound into the ground that are more like rectangular shaped. I think I would yeah. want a round one because then it doesn't really matter where you pierce the chest. It's going to kind of find its own way through that mess of ribs and bones and then right into the heart. But you might have to stab a couple times to get the heart right, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> you think we could do it without the hammer? You think we could just jab it on in there? I think you would need the hammer. I think you got to have a hammer to go with it. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I see people do it using knives. I mean, you know, why couldn't you use a knife? I mean, really, what's the difference between a knife and a steak other than, I guess, the material? Yeah, in the, in the book, they use knives on Dracula, so I, th- I guess it does work. But I don't yeah. know. The movies do have you, kind of written new laws. As a, as a side note, do you? I assume you've read Dracula, the, the novel. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that book? Uh, it was as a, when I first read it as a kid, it would just absolutely blew my mind and I was obsessed with it. I would go around talking in this terrible uh, version of 1890s kind of, uh, like late Victorian talk just because I was so obsessed with it. And, um, and you know, as I every time I've reread it, as I got older, I found myself less less impressed with it. Literarily, it's a bit clunky in places, especially starting off. But it is still, it's just a, it's something really magical. Like I don't know if enough people realize how revolutionary it was at the time. <clears throat> um, you know, in, in that not only was this concept uh, of the vampire still kind of pretty new to a lot of re- readers, especially a wide audience. I mean, it was originally titled something like Count Vampire and no, and it was not a spoiler. <laughs> like that's a little people knew of the thing, but it was also experimental in its form. Like it was a, it was a mixed media book. Like you got people's letters, their journals, the transcripts right. off of the, off of the wax cylinders. And then it does this weird thing with, the narrative in which it just kind of transforms into an impossibly close perspective from from Mina Harker and it just it does a lot of beautiful things and it leaves a lot of mystery uh, behind Dracula that I think later films have tried to come in and solve for people but what Dracula is and 
why vampires are and, and and what's at the heart of all of it really in the book it, it's an absolute mystery and i think there's some magic behind that it sets out the groundwork that has been i don't know replicated so many times and it's interesting how many times that's been made into movies and each movie it kind of, I don't know, disassembles that book in different ways and makes some characters more important than other characters, eliminates some of the characters, changes the story a lot. Some of them stick pretty closely to it. It's uh, interesting how one novel can have that many different approaches in cinematically. Yeah, yeah, like Francis Ford Coppola wants to see it as like a love story, and you yeah. can, but if you go into that novel not thinking love story, there's no love story at all. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just, it's, it is really interesting how, how much it lends itself to interpretation. I think that the, uh, the Nosferatu film, the early German mm-hmm. film is, is probably one of my favorite kind of takes on it, though. It's just yeah, a I gorgeous film. One. I also love the, the remake of that, that was 79 with uh, Klaus Kinski in it. And that's also oh, kind of yeah. an early slow burn film. It's kind of, but I love kind of that plodding nature of, of that movie. And I love his version of Nosferatu, the, his, the way that monster looks is really cool. Yeah, that you get the you get the full Werner Herzog experience of just right. <laughs> sitting there and watching these amazing things, like that, like the ship kind of rolling into town yeah. while it's this dead ship and and spinning bats. a lot of t- and bats, yeah, <laughs> yeah, lots of lots of slow mo bats. It's 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 beautiful though, it really is. Oh my God! Well, I've I've pushed you well past well, well past 40, 40 minutes or so. Um, you've been extremely generous with your time. It's it's been a lot of fun talking to you. Maybe we can kind of start reeling it in with just letting a, not that not that there aren't enough people watching your stuff, <laughs> but just in case we can f- send a few more people your way to check out, say your weekend woodworker and uh, and uh, your YouTube channel. Where should where should listeners go to find out more about you and your projects if if they're interested? Yeah, thanks. You can head over to on YouTube. You can just search for Steve Ramsey would be the easiest way or Woodworking for Mere Mortals. Both of those will get you to my channel where you can watch lots and lots of woodworking videos. And if by some strange chance you're actually interested in learning woodworking and you've just been something you've been thinking about, hey, maybe I want to do that. I can. I have created courses, online courses to get you started with very little investment and you don't really need a lot of space. That's kind of the whole point of Woodworking for Mere Mortals. And those are over at theweekendwoodworker.com and you can check out those courses to get you started. Yeah, and and you were the master of figuring out how to do it without space. Like, weren't you in an apartment while you started at one point, like dangling power cords yeah. up to the yeah, roof? Funny. We, we we lived in San Francisco for about ten years before we moved. I live in Marin County now, which is just north of San Francisco. And when we were living in the city, we had a apartment. It was a six unit apartment building, kind of typical in San Francisco. We were on the top floor, and so I could I had access to the roof, so I could I could take an extension cord from the kitchen window and it were like dangle it down from the roof into the kitchen window and then I could run power tools and I could build things up there. <laughs> I even I even remember making a, a shelf for all of my VHS tapes at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hang on to them? I've got to know the VHS. Oh, I, I, I have some of them. And you know what I was doing? I was I was like there's this store it, it's in San Francisco it was called uh, Le Video and they specialized in in, in independent cult exploitation films and all these just really weird films that were really you couldn't find anywhere else and I think a lot of their copies were just bootlegged copies because the the covers on them were like photocopies you know that they just like <laughs> slapped on there but I would take those and then I would just copy them. and a lot of those they didn't have any kind of VHS protection so I would get these really obscure movies and then I would <clears throat> I would additionally photocopy their photocopy to make my own version of that VHS thing. So it was like, it was one of those really, you know, several generation copies of the tape, of the cover and everything. But it was something really cool about watching movies like that. 
Yeah, that's that's something else that's kind of maybe lost a, a little. Some of the magic has maybe faded. Is is the era when so much of the stuff wasn't so perfectly immediately accessible? Like you hear about some strange horror film, and and you've got to work for months to even find a bootleg copy of it, even if you can. And and yeah. now everything's just at at your fingertips. And I don't know. It kind of takes the quest out of, out of searching for the dark corners of of the film world it kind of takes a quest out of it i don't know it does and this is not you know there's not the the fun of displaying all of your movies when everything's you know video on demand and you know i've kind of gone through that myself where i used to have lots of dvds and i ended up just getting rid of them all i kind of thought well i don't really need them anything i want is pretty much available online so i know what's the point but yeah i do kind of miss that in a way yeah Goodness gracious. Well, I tell you what, it's been, it's been a fantastic, uh, time talking with you, Steve. Uh, I really enjoyed talking not only a little bit of woodworking and finding out a little bit more about, about your journey, but, uh, getting a fantastic list of horror movies I haven't seen yet. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, I hope you check them out. Yeah, finding out some cool, some cool, uh, ideas on your thoughts on these things. And now we have the answer, by the way, if we left you with nothing other than pragmatic knowledge of how to, how to make your stakes if you plan on <laughs> vampire hunting or re- turn them around and use maple and, uh, and have a hammer ready and you're that much safer in the the world now <laughs> hey it can't hurt to be prepared right <laughs> that's right well thank you so much again it's been a real pleasure steve rams thank you